So the quick draw was a big deal with the flat saps because they would slip out of a pocket so easily. In the dark, this would look like your wallet almost. Yeah. You know, like, okay, here's my wallet. Bam, you know. And <laughs> I'm here talking with Robert Escobar, who wrote this book and published this book back in 2018 called Saps, Blackjacks, and Slingshots, A History of Forgotten Weapons. It's 300 pages of really, really good, dense material that he writes very engagingly. So I'm really excited to have him on the show. Um, thank you for, for joining. Hey, thanks. For people who haven't read the book yet, uh, what's a sap and what's the difference between that and blackjacks? Okay. So here we go. <laughs> a sap is any sack-like container. And again, you know, nobody had, like, nobody thought this was worth classifying, thinking through, right? So I had to make a lot of decisions for the actual taxonomy of this to classify them. I mean, it wasn't easy. Like, it was very complicated and contradictory. So in my estimation, a sap is any sack-like collection of a heavy, dense material for hitting people. And you could probably, you might be able to hear the you know, the pellets in there. Um, so if you took like a, like a prison classic or a street classic would be like a, a, a padlock in a sock, mm -hmm. get a dense heavy load in a sack of some kind and it's for hitting people. Uh, so I believe the original sap was a sandbag. Those go back to like the late middle ages, early Renaissance. And that seems like a crazy thing to fight with. Cause why would you fight with that? When you could just, you know, have a, a big wooden, you know, wooden club or whatever. Nevertheless, they existed. I think they became popular for sanctioned duels. Sanctioned duels where they were hoping the people wouldn't kill each other. <laughs> okay, you two are driving each other crazy in our village with this beef you have. We're going to let you, instead of having you just brawl in the street, we're going to arrange a showdown, and you're going to use these bags full of sand, so we hope you get it out of your system, both of you, and hopefully live, right? So a blood feud it doesn't develop between the families because one, one of the people dies. Right. If you want to knock somebody unconscious, but you're trying not to kill them, you're hoping not to spill blood all over the place, et cetera, et cetera. Then a sandbag is really, really good for that. So then it starts getting used by muggers. And that's why sandbags were used by muggers all the way into the 20th century. Even into the 20th century, sandbagger, that word was synonymous for mugger, because that's how often they used it to just knock people out, take the wallet and go. So anyway, sack, sack like container. Blackjack is totally different. Mm, let's do where's my yeah, there it is here's a buckheimer was the major uh sap and blackjack maker in the 20th century they were a leather goods you know manufacturer and they made a lot of police goods police holsters this kind of thing look how little this thing is like when i hold it here it looks kind of decent sized i mean look at that in my hand right a blackjack is a cylindrical mini club it's got a dense almost always lead striking head on the end of a flexible shaft, right? Almost always a steel coil. Nowadays, like a cable has become more popular. Not more popular, but it's become kind of popular. Uh, but in the old days, they did use cable as well. I think I was the first one to realize that and prove it. Uh, but the classic design was a steel coil with kind of a lead bullet, just a fat lead bullet. And it's amazing how much power this little thing can generate. So that's a blackjack. Very, very different from a sap but they're both kind of these little dense heavy lead flexible pocket clubs so that's why i lumped them into the same family uh nobody had ever uh discovered when the blackjack was invented uh so i you saw in the book like i i, I don't claim anything as definite but i'm pretty sure i found the guy an american cop uh who invented it about you know 120 years ago so that's what a blackjack is if you remember a real iconic scene from the untouchables Sean Connery is about to get into a fight with Andy Garcia, and Andy Garcia pulls out his, well, sorry, pulls out his revolver and puts it to Sean Connery's throat while Sean Connery holds up this tiny little thing. And as a kid, I always wonder, like, what is he holding? It looks so small. I thought it was like his keychain or something. He was holding a blackjack of about this size. This is a pretty oh. small blackjack. So that's what a blackjack is. Saps, blackjacks. A slung shot is like a monkey fist. And I think most viewers probably will know monkey fist is a round knot tied around a weight and so it's more like a true pocket flail right that swings 100 percent free this you know this this one swings free too the sap but there's no knot holding it together so sailors a long time ago would tie a circular knot around a weight then they'd fling that weight to maybe another ship or to deck or whatever 
and it's a way to transport a rope efficiently because if you try to throw a rope without a weight on the end of it it's not going right. to work very well uh so the sailors had used to have to watch out by for getting you know knocked out or concussed with that incoming you know friendly flyer uh and it wasn't too long before somebody realized well why don't i just cut the end off of this and carry it in my pocket you'll take a a steel ball bearing it's only about this big in diameter but that's pretty heavy and dense and when you have that swinging freely it actually generates a tremendous amount of power so here's an old slung shot this one's a monster so again a solid this is not the rope like knot of course that i talked about somebody in the old days went with the leather but it's like almost like an easter egg or like a like a bullet you know like a missile head because of the free swinging nature right they swing the most freely a slung shot so because of the free swinging nature and the weight, it's still, it's only the size of like a big fist load, right? And I'm a, I'm a little Latino dude. So a big guy would, this would hide in his hand perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really the size of a fist load, but that weight right there with this much free swing, like right, let's test this. I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, literally absolutely lethal. So slung shot, sap. A picture of a sock filled with sand, which people used to use to fight with. Uh, slung shot. Oh, yeah, duh. we started with a slung shot, right? And then here's another blackjack. So just a crazy looking thing, right? There's pellets packed in there. And then that, that hurts a lot, like a lot. <laughs> I, was, I was only swinging with like this much leeway within this much space. But it hurt as much as if I handed a buddy, um, let's say like an ASP baton and let him hit me in the palm, I would say like from here to here. Like that's how much that hurt. And I was just going like this with my wrist. So they, they generate all of these, generate a tremendous, my hand still hurts. <laughs> they generate a tremendous amount of power in a small space. And they, they're so small, they practically fit in your pocket. That's the selling point. That's why they were popular for so long. So I remember there was a, um, from page 144 that I was curious about. Let me mm -hmm. see if I can find it. Um, I, I think it, it, it talked about the, the recoil, like that secondary recoil was, it, it created an extra pop that could break bones. And I was yeah. like, I couldn't imagine that in my head. I was curious if you could sort of explain the physics of that. Yeah. The physics of these are also really interesting because part of the appeal originally for saps was like, if you're a cop, you know, people can say what they want, but if you're a cop, you're, you're trying not to kill the suspect. You're just trying to apprehend him, right? Yeah. So a less lethal club is, you know, more appropriate than like a mace, right? Like, you know, a mace would, would do more damage, but you're not going to carry that. So you want something that does the job while, you know, semi-minimizing damage. Again, like we talked about the muggers, a murder is going to bring more attention from law enforcement. You're just trying to put somebody to sleep so you can take their money and run. So, so it's like a compassionate weapon. <laughs> kind of sort of. It's a slightly, slightly, uh, you know, more gentle kind of impact weapon. But they're either soft, like I keep talking about. I love it. So they're so, so crazy. It's so weird, right? So this loose collection of pellets in here, or like this one, tons of these, this one here. And what happens, it, it's very unique within the world of weaponry. What happens when that hits is that it, it feels like a solid object, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not technically a solid object. And that little bit of give in there means those things jostle around as they hit, right? So as impact is made, they kind of shake and come together. They produce almost like a secondary, like a sticking impact. If you think of like Eastern martial arts and like an internal strike, like right here, these guys train for years, theoretically, like I, the one I hit, it really sinks into their body kind of a thing. That's what it does. And that's proven by modern science because there's modern tools that use the exact same principle these are built on. A dead blow hammer is basically a blackjack hammer. You use it to pound things into place when you're working without damaging them. And just like this has a leather exterior, so leather is tough, but it's not the hardest material we could find, right? A dead blow hammer will often have like a polyurethane exterior, something like that. So you have a soft shell with shifting internals, all of that combines when it strikes to, like I said, create that kind of sticking. Think of everything, imagine everything in there striking and then, you know, kind of like bouncing down, but it happens in a fraction of a second, right? Like that. So it, it hits and it sticks. So that's that sinking feel that the soft saps get. My theory is when you hit like a, uh, like a knockout spot, classic behind the ear, that sinking impact is part of what made them such efficient 
knockout tools. It's why they were kind of the world's original stun guns. And now we haven't talked about flat saps yet. So these are called flat saps, even though they're not like, you know, sack like containers. They kind of are, I guess. What this really is, though, is a flattened evolution of the blackjack. So the cylinder got flattened at the head and in the shaft. Instead of a steel coil, which of course is round in cross section, they started using a flat spring steel. Look how thin that is. And instead of that big fat lead bullet that we talked about, you use more of a spoon shaped lead bullet. So it's still lead with flexible steel, but in an almost two dimensional way. You know, if you're a cop and you're gonna ride around in your patrol car or whatever all day long, this is gonna feel much, much better. Originally, uh, it was more about spreading the impact out than carry comfort, right? Because blackjacks, funny enough, although the man who invented them was trying to make a more humane police club, because that was a big thing in the 19th century, all these inventors are trying to come up with more humane police clubs. That's what this was an attempt to do, and he failed miserably because these things are devastating, right? They're just, they're skull crackers. Uh, they were notorious for causing bleeding. Um, in the old days, if you saw a guy, like I'm, I'm losing my hair, so we'll pretend here. If you saw a guy like me back in the old days, like this spot here, that could have been from a blackjack strike that would scar the skin so badly that hair would never grow again. The flat sap, again, you flatten it out, now you're, now you're much less likely to get that bleeding, that cutting. But it also made it very convenient for carry, which made it super popular with cops. It is more gentle, so to speak. Their idea was when I hit, it can flex to protect the person getting hit, right? Mm -hmm. It gives them some impact. Great, because I'm trying to knock this person out. But it's going to make sure I don't do too much damage because the more I drive through, the more it flexes. Mm -hmm. That was their idea. If you hit at the right speed, the tempo, whatever, that's what's going to happen. It's going to, like, it's protecting my arm at this speed. But this thing's flexible. And what they did not intend, just like they didn't intend it with this, is that the backswing, right? If I yank back and let it load as I'm swinging so that it, com it, it comes back to true position mm -hmm. as I strike, then it's going to greatly increase the impact. So even with this, if you time it right, and I'm not going to do it because I'll like, it'll really hurt my hand, right? <laughs> Same thing. If I get the timing right, then this flexibility, instead of helping the person getting hit, it only hurts them even more. You know, if we think about like impact weapons, there's been all kinds all throughout history. There's not that many that play into the things we've just been talking about. Like that, this is a very unique weapons family, you know, when you stop and think about it. Uh, why why did you categorize slung shots with a sap and black tracks? Is that is that a categorization that existed or is that something that you ended up um, combining with the other two? With that's, a real, that's a really insightful question. You did. You did read. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. I chose to do that because these are all, what they all share in common is enough for me to group them together and I want to save all of their stories, right? What ties all of them together is their small, flexible, weighted impact weapons. And the slung shots fit into that category too, right? I can wrap this up, carry it in my pocket, and when trouble starts, you know, pop it out and, and go to town. So they share those primal features. So even though slung shots, they're more like cousins, this and this are brother and sister, blackjacks and flat saps. And then, you know, this and a sandbag share the same lineage for sure without question uh but then the slung shot has that kind of maritime origin uh but yeah it's, it's a you know it's like us and neanderthals right it's like you know <laughs> yeah in your research did you ever see them being used on like non-human targets uh yes <laughs> so probably the number one category for that is fish so there is fish? talk of there. Yeah. One of the many, many names for these kinds of things is fish priest. So a fish, fish priest is used to send the fish to the afterlife, right? So you give it its final benediction, right? I was right. It's so interesting. Like we'll never, I love this one. It's just cool. I think it's gorgeous. Right. Yeah. In this one, you can actually see the lead, which I think is kind of cool. And the handy I mean, that's work. some interesting crocheting. Yeah. The handiwork is so exquisite. Somebody went to a lot of trouble. I really love this one. Uh, but, you know, was this just used to dispatch fish after you hauled them out of the water? Maybe, maybe not. We'll never know. Then again, you know, people often would fight with something that they carried for another purpose anyway. So even if this thing here was built for a fisherman to carry, 
if it was in his pocket later at the pub and he got into trouble or whatever, guess what he was going to do? So we'll never know if this was a purpose-built anti-human weapon or anti-fish weapon. But you can still go to Amazon today and find, I don't think they'll call them fish priests, but you can find fish clubs, clubs that are literally designed to dispatch your fish after you drag it out of the water. So to answer your question, yes, for sure, and fish. That's the the one use case where we can say for sure they were used for animals. <laughs> so I, I was curious, um, like, what got you into writing a book about saps? Was it because of the history or was it because of saps? Yeah. So I collect antique weapons. I collect antiques. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of money for it, but whatever, who and I can and, and what I can, right? So there are like cheap old antiques. I was going to show you, for instance, this coin is one of my favorites. It's really cheap. It costs like 10 bucks. It's from 400 to 350 BC, which you're not going to, you know, the resolution is not going to come out when I zoom in on it, but it's a Phoenician coin. I love Phoenician history. So I love history. I'm a huge history nerd. I like collecting old books, coins, you name it, but weapons too, because I love martial arts. So usually if I look at something or end up buying it or whatever, it gives me an excuse to learn about it, right? You buy a certain kind of bayonet, you know, like that's, I can't believe they had a bayonet like this, you know, like there's a cookery bayonet. It makes no sense. Why would you have a bayonet shaped like this big <laughs> inward folding hatching blade? It makes no sense, but they had it. So anyway, um, I had bought this right here it's in two pieces it's quite old and delicate this is a native american war club have you ever seen a haft like that in your life i've never seen that it, at all isn't that each notch is painted a different color but this is just for grabbing if you hit somebody with the wood it wouldn't be nice it would cut there's very there's only one tassel left yeah it's this is cree nation so this is um northern you know uh north america canada northern united states and it's broken but this is how it was originally put together. So you've got a very long haft, but what we have, of course, is a flail and a, like a full-size battle flail, right? This was this was an instrument of war, right? This was you know, when the Cree would go to act, you know, all-out war with somebody. That's black bear fur. But the weird thing is, I got a flexible connection. Yeah, it's a flail and that's a stone, right? Mm -hmm. You can see how, see how much work went into that, you know, for them to to stitch that together, it's got to hold together in, in battle, but all that work so you could have, you know, with, they didn't have much iron ore and, and metallurgy, right? So, so that you could have a functioning flail. So anyway, I bought this, I just absolutely loved it, but it was called a slung shot war club, right? Not sling, but slung, slung shot war club. So that got me reading. And uh, to answer your question, I'd never found a subject ever that had less information out there, like not, not even one book, you know what I mean? And that, kind of started giving me down the rabbit trail. I had this super nerdy dream of capturing one day a history that, you know, one other, no one else had captured and two was definitely going to disappear. And this one was going to disappear. Like these weapons, they were really big for centuries and centuries in all kinds of cultures. And uh, even by like my dad's generation, they were fading. Uh, but historically speaking, they were around for a very long time and up until recently, but it's like they really just kind of abruptly disappeared off the map in a way that a lot of other weapons and like weapons culture don't. So I wanted to, you know, find the story and write it down. Yeah. How do you think that happened? I was reading like about um, why saps are, are disappearing, at least in law enforcement. And they mentioned that it's because, um, well, like tasers are so much more efficient and pose less of a, you know, less bodily harm on the, the person mm -hmm. using it. Um, is that, was that the case with the, these kinds of impact weapons? You, they have a real interesting, one of the things I loved about the story too, is it's this real cop and criminal thing. The whole kind of weapons family started with, I mean, depends on how far back you want to go, but like in the, in the modern age, basically, it was more on the criminal side. Then cops started carrying saps and blackjacks, which of course we can get into the details and I've got a bunch of them here. Um, and so then they kind of were the prominent users and then it made a real big criminal comeback again, so like the Al Capone days you know, prohibition, those kind of uh, mafioso and that kind of thing became real big in those circles. And then it was just kind of popular everywhere. Um, police, when they stopped using them, that I guess really kind of drained, you know, the, the marketplace, if you will. So Smith & Wesson used to make these for cops. This one here is made by, mm -hmm. made by Smith & Wesson, or it was way back when. And you'd open up a police catalog and they'd have guns and holsters and all kinds of things, whistles and whatever. And for about a century of American history, they would have a page with saps and blackjacks so i think once the cop market disappeared they just started to get made less like a lot less 
And mm -hmm. then people moved on to things that are easier to find. Because if you're just looking to beat somebody up, right, for lack of a better description, you could come up with something a lot easier than, you know, as a collection of BBs, right, or metal shot, carefully condensed, sewn up, sealed, attached to the spring, right? Like, it takes craftsmanship to make this. Like, so you could just pick up a wrench, right? Or, a, you know, just a wooden billy club, et cetera. So I, this is my, my hypothesis is once professional makers stopped making these, because they were made before pros too, like in the old days, a saddle maker could just turn you out one of these if you mm -hmm. wanted one, et cetera. But that tradition kind of died because the big corporations, semi-big, took over, leather makers anyway. And uh, so once they stopped, the supply stopped, and, you know, people didn't bother waiting around. They just started using other things. Tastes changed. And these things really reek of like that, just that old tough guy, 1940s and earlier, you know, milieu, the fedora, and the trench mm -hmm. coat. So part of it is that they're they're really part of that scene. And then when that died fashion-wise, um, people underestimate greatly how much of a role fashion plays in martial arts. But it really does, right? Well, this looks cooler over here. So once something becomes uncool, well, you don't want to carry that into your you know with you as your edc or to your fight or whatever right yeah so there's i think there's a fashion element too where this was like oh that's my granddad's kind of thing this was this is the kind of thing you'd see in a uh you know in a humphrey bogart movie so i wanted to to dive a little bit into your the just vast amount of resources that that you've used to compile like a, a picture of how the weapons have changed over the years like what is your research process it's a, it's not I mean, easy. You've got, you've got songs, you've got like <laughs> poems and like pictures and, and they're, they're not necessarily from weapons books. Like no, how did you right? find them? That was what made it really challenging too, is since there was nothing in, within the usual suspects, I had to go to other places to find it. So this was totally different. So I really had to find those little, little itty bitty snippets of relevant information. A lot of police memoirs and criminal memoirs, since they were the two big users. And like a point I make in the book, which I thought was fairly interesting about these two is before firearms, nothing was more popular with both sides of the law than these, which we could call pocket clubs as a, as an overall category, right? Or saps nowadays serves as a category, even though technically they're only one of one version of this um, because cops wouldn't carry swords, right? They did for a little <laughs> while. Some of them, uh, they wouldn't carry knives. Some of them did once in a while, it's still let over, they shouldn't have. Um, so of course, they would carry billy clubs, but if you lose your billy club eh, back in the days when maybe you didn't even have a gun, right? You just had your billy club. You lose that billy club, you're really in trouble. So you, of course, you want backup for that. Um, so they embrace these for those, that reason and more. Criminals love them as well because you can hide it in your pocket, but it provides the same power as a full size, you know, right? Two foot billy club. Uh, so actually, they're the only thing that was that popular with both sides, like I said, until firearms came along. But so criminal and cop histories, but it gets into a naval history, like some, like you might've seen if you got into that section, I think my third chapter is about, you know, mm -hmm. sailor weapons. I knew what kinds of people were specialists in these things. So I'd have to just go like comb through anything I could find and do a million keyword searches and just try to find something relevant. Um, and then those popular culture, uh, you know, if something was big in song at one point, it's because it was a thing. So mm -hmm. I knew like scanning pop culture, it could just be somebody's old diary, you name it. If I found the right word, say, okay, that sounds interesting. That might be relevant. Uh, and then I would just have to go and find out every time. So I have, I think, 491 references in the book. And I probably kept one for every like 50 times I tried and thought I found something relevant because um, the other thing about these is that the language of the verbiage is very confusing, right? Yeah. You generally that. call them saps. But in the old days, a sap was a club, a wooden club, because you made it out of the sapling of a tree. And then at some point, for no reason anybody understands, leather bags filled with BBs, basically, or sand started getting called saps. So I could find an old account and say, oh, great, somebody got knocked out with a sap. Awesome. And then I'd read about it and be like, one, I can't tell what kind of weapon they're talking about, so I can't use that source because it might have been an actual wooden club, you know, or two, oh, I found out. They are talking about wooden club. Nope, that doesn't count. The word blackjack only started uh, fairly recently. So there were things like blackjacks earlier in history, but they weren't called that. So what were they called? It depends. So uh, I have a whole section of... Um, of acronyms and you know synonyms for all these kinds of things like life preserver back in back to england like a gentleman who carried this for self-defense in england would have called it a life preserver but obviously even back in the day 
life preserver meant that thing that you throw to somebody in the water. So it was fun to just check every, yeah, like you said, poems. I'm, I'm reading through poems and finding, you know, mentions of a, a blackjack along with a stiletto. And, you know, stitching all that together, you realize, oh, these really were a big thing, you know, and for a long time. But you had to draw those connections and just kind of like these are sewn together, just sew together all these various points to realize, oh, that's that's the same thing that's getting talked about 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century movie. You know what I mean? Like the name changes, but I've got it. And tracing out the story that way, if that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting I, I remember um well in the very beginning of the book when you talked about like shanghai being used as as an a, a, a verb to to describe mm -hmm. being hit i always thought that shanghai was kidnapping um so. yeah well you, you you hit them over the head so you can kidnap them <laughs> so you can drag them onto your ship and then it becomes just for kidnapping but so much which i didn't even it. realize was a thing i didn't know that back then all the sailors were, or a lot of sailors were basically kidnapped how did they like get compliance from uh, well, unwilling like, crews like riots would happen uh as i understand it from my research they would frequent taverns that's that's a good idea show up after somebody's five rounds in at the pub and <laughs> knock them over the head they're not gonna have as much fight in them you know at 2 a.m after all of that as if you show up in broad daylight and try to drag them out of their house right and you'd have these press gangs like to press you into service impressment so press gang shows up they've all got wooden cudgels saps that kind of thing uh slung shots and they just beat up people and drag them away yeah and then the people would rebel and bystanders would get involved and you can see these old beautiful illustrations of street riots because people <laughs> realize hey they're doing it again they're dragging some of our guys away again yeah to, you know to join the navy when i can i love old books right i love old books and like reading old books like physical old books i love that yeah but then these like heroic seriously you know librarians and archivists have scanned just uh, you know mountains of old texts and not just like the cool stuff not just the popular stuff but these really obscure books so you can go there if you're interested and find i love folk tales mythology right i've done yeah. three books in a row on that so you can go find these wonderful old books and even on the scan you can tell how old the original source material was um and it's challenging because it's getting better nowadays with the technology but it's still kind of hard like you can do a keyword search but it's pretty cumbersome and there's a lot of stuff out there that only like a really a specialist researcher is ever going to trip over but they're really amazing books i love them they, they'll have like you know, a 20 word title. I love the old titles. I love a 20 word title and just some crazy little slice of history that again is not popular, might only ever come up on the radar of someone who's really researching something very specific. So I've always loved reading stuff like that when I can. I mean, every, every 10 I read, probably maybe I find one possible, you know, possibly useful instance, but whatever I read is interesting anyway. Like I was, yeah. reading, an, I was reading an account of an American farmer during the revolution fighting with his flail his actual agricultural flail so two-handed half right you know for threshing grain using it against a french officer with his small sword and uh that one it was driving me crazy because i couldn't figure out did this actually happen because people did not they weren't as explicit as we would have liked in the old days and i found a professor who's an expert in this female author so she was a rarity from like the 18th century who wrote the story but she wrote it as if it was a story she really heard in new england and i was like but is she doing that as artistic license? Is this an actual urban legend, so to speak, from back then? And I'm, I'm going crazy trying to find out. I'd love to know, did this really happen? Or was it, was it at least a real story? And I couldn't even find out that much. And I sent that woman an email, never got an answer, but I, I decided to use that one. So you can imagine how much work I put into that. And that one, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and use it, even though I, I wish I could prove that it actually happened. How are you able to distinguish between, you know, larger than life type stories and, and actual firsthand, you know, accounts? Yeah, it's great. Accounts like, things? I mean, yeah, you have, like, I take this stuff very seriously and uh, I try to approach it as a story. And when I did my SAP book, the first one, like I really wanted to make a great history book. Mm -hmm. my, my little elevator pitch was it's a, it's a history book that happens to be about weapons, not a weapons book that happens to have some history. Like, no offense to most weapons books, but they're about the weapons and they have some history. It's always the same, right? They start off a little bit. Okay, Okinawa, they're you hear the samurai and they hate them and they start, you know, training, blah, blah, blah. And then they just, you know, you just jump into the technique, et cetera. So I wanted to do the opposite. And uh, I just have to, you just look at it with like, you know, a real serious historical methodology lens. I, I really try to avoid saying something as fact unless I can say 
unless I'm certain that it is a fact. And that's why I have 491 citations. Again, no offense to other weapons books, but I mean, you know, how many footnotes you usually get in a in a weapons book? Not that. So I really wanted to back up my hypothesis and the whole story I was telling. What was the first antique weapon you purchased and uh, how did you find it? That's a great question. I'll tell a super quick story first. Um, I'm Colombian, Colombian American, and we would go to Colombia every year when my sister and I were kids, my parents would take us. And there's this wonderful old house where some of our relatives lived all together. And uh, one of the rooms had a bunch of swords and, and weapons. And, you know, in the old days, like a Victorian gentleman would collect like, yeah, here's a spear from the Zulu and have it on the wall, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And here's a tiger skin and whatever. So it was a room like that. And then there was a section with swords because we had a relative who apparently was an officer of some rank and some some little dust up that Colombia and Peru had, like who knows, you know, what, right? Some some little tiny little dust up of a war, but it had his his stuff, including the sword, I still remember. And I was always told, you know, Kiki, you're gonna get all that stuff one day, because I knew I loved that kind of thing. And I never got any of it, but I'm not bitter. Uh, but I think that started my love of like old, it was old and it was weapons. I think I got my love of antiques from that. And then I had a history professor and he's still teaching at my high school back in Miami. Uh, freshman year history so it's world history and he had a love for weapons so he'd always sprinkle its lectures in with stuff like that and and i think those two things came together and that's what got it started that was the first one i ever bought okay the first one i ever bought was in new orleans and it was a uh it was a tolwar which is a indian saber new orleans has uh you know there's more than one place we can go to the antiques obviously like lots of them and there's at least one place real near Lafayette Square uh, called Cohen and Sons or something like that. And it's just, it's giant. It's got lots of antique weapons. But I remember going down the street in the French Quarter and finding other places. I held a pair of Saxon dueling pistols, um, just all kinds of great stuff there. Um, <laughs> How much was it out of curiosity? I think it was like 300 bucks. I didn't have I didn't have kids then, so I had the luxury of <laughs> uh, <laughs> buying things like that. Yeah. <laughs> So were women also known to use staffs and blackjacks? So I also looked at other uh, primary sources as well, and it seemed to indicate that it was mostly men using them. Although sometimes like secondary sources would say like prostitutes also carried them, but I just mm-hmm. never, I never like saw that in, in your book. There was a something, uh, a little bit, a passage about gigolettes fighting with sandbags, but they're not, mm-hmm. I mean, it was like improvised weapon sort of for that situation, as opposed to like something that they carried for self-protection. Uh, for self-protection, for sure. I do have some women carrying them for self-protection. There was like a, an FBI agent or a woman who would interview high security and was, she had to, it was like, chocolate and a blackjack or a sap in her purse in case they got out of hand um there was a female mob boss who was also a nurse she wouldn't necessarily use it herself but she instructed her thugs where the proper mm-hmm. knockout spots were you know um the jigglets like you mentioned are fascinating so for p- people who don't know we're talking about parisian think moulin rouge era paris right parisian female gang members fighting with sandbags in the street, which actually happened. Uh, but from like a mugging perspective, the women honestly would usually lure the the the, the mark. <laughs> they would usually lure the man in, the victim, and then it was the guys that would spring out of the shadows and use the sap or whatever to knock somebody out. Uh, there's an incident I know of, and off the top of my head, I don't even remember if it's in my book. There's an incident from uh, some street riots in New York And I think it was the 19th century, maybe the early 20th, where women were getting ready to defend their house, apartments probably. Uh, So they were boiling water to pour on people, that kind of thing. And they took lead sinkers, right, lead fishing weights, and tied them on lines. So they would have basically slung shots to use during what I call the labor wars, right, all the a lot of violence around organized crime, getting involved with labor unions, strikes, all of that kind of thing back in Detroit, et cetera. And I've got a lot of guys uh, using them back then. But uh, what some of the women protesters did, and this is a classic old school sap, is it would take a bar of hard soap. And if you're old enough, you kind of remember back in the day, soap was not nice. Like it was just this brick of soap. But they would take actual hand soap, drop it in a sock, and carry that on the picket line and use it. The women would then use it if they had to. And the other thing about that was they could carry those two pieces in separate pockets 
and now you are not carrying a weapon, which is one of the attractions to what I call improvised saps. Some of the some of the assembled versions, what's attractive or what was to people is you could carry them and you can't get arrested for carrying a bar of soap. And I know I had a, a Canadian story about a woman putting a, taking off her stocking, putting a rock in it, and chasing the men to make them stop fighting and whacking people. I've got that in there. <laughs> That's um, excellent. You haven't gotten to the end of the book, so I'm going to spoil something for you. But since you're asking about women sap users, the strangest duels probably in all of human history involve a woman versus a man, and the woman is holding a sap. This is about um, the German wives having the marital the marital duels. Yeah, yeah. That actually reminds me of there was um I don't know if it was uh, one of your YouTube videos. There was a weapon made out of, out of a glove. Was that your video? Yeah, it, it basically almost, was filled with sand. <laughs> I almost brought it, but it's it leaks so much sand that I didn't bring it. Yeah, um, you know somebody could have made this up, of course, but I bought it anyway because I have in my research shown people filling gloves with sand and using them as weapons. Like that's definitely happened. A glove, handy container, fill it with sand, grab it by the end, hit, right? Sounds insane, but- um, But did they use a, it like like deceptively? Like they had their hand in, in their sleeve, but what you saw was I, actually the sap inside? I like, thought, I wondered that too. I, my heart says yes, but I couldn't prove it. Like that would be great. <laughs> and somebody, sh somebody should put that in a movie where the guy's got his leather glove or woman coming, coming out of the sleeve. And then they walk up to somebody and then it's revealed that they're holding a glove and they knock the person out. Like I've got a whole list of things that should be in movies that aren't, that are based on like actual historical weapons. I'm going to totally go on a tangent here. If you watch a movie like Gangs of New York, I love that movie, but the weapons are just all just mostly just made up ridiculous things. And there's really interesting, bizarre historical weapons. And I wish movies would put real old weapons instead of made up ones in their uh, in their movies. So, but the same like the so the sandbag, the sand glove, I guess we'd call it, is basically <laughs> a sandbag that happens to be a glove. Yeah, like they packed it as tightly, they stuffed it as tightly as absolutely possible to point of bursting, and then they stitched it closed. You know, somebody put a lot of work into that crazy thing. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I believe that was real and I have one and I wish I'd shown it to you, but it, it leaks sand as soon as you touch it. It's still at the house, yeah. Well, let's talk about your other weapons there. Okay, yeah, awesome. Man, so here's a good one. This is a sap. So somebody sewed this together a long time ago. It is filled with nothing but sand. This is technically a sandbag, but I'd call it a sap. This is kind of a classic sap shape. Look at that. It looks like a meat cleaver, right? Isn't that great? Right. I'm, I was going to say almost any other weapon, but forget that. Any other weapon in human history, in any culture, if it was shaped like this and it was an impact weapon, you know, think about the hardwood clubs of like the Pacific Islands, you mm. know, all kinds of things like that, right? It would be to strike with the edge, but not something like this. This, even though you hold it like a knife, it's meant to strike with the sides, right? So that's way more gentle than the ones I was touching before. But and that's not a ton of sand. This is not heavy. So this how did they keep the, the seam closed with that sort yeah. of impact? One, one of the things I love about these is how weird they are. Like, why would you want to trust a weapon that might burst open on you and become utterly useless, right? right? But people <laughs> did it. I do have instances in my book, too, where the, the stupid thing falls apart on you, right? Like, you really wanted to have a quality sap. And if yours was starting to show a lot of age and the stitching is starting to look a little loose, you better replace it. Like you do not want to trust a loose one. We haven't talked about technique a ton yet, but another unique thing is, like I said, any other weapon, it would be like this. Instead, it's like this. And like I've trained in all kinds of weapons. You know, how often do you do this with a weapon? Almost never. Imagine, just imagine holding a knife, but fighting by smacking with the sides. <laughs> that, that's we how we you sometimes do that in Cali, in Filipino martial arts, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's like, ah, right? Like, Mostly about, to deflect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like to deflect. Think about, like, this is my primary strike, is like a slap. Yeah, that's right? wild. <laughs> yeah, think about that. You, you do not do that very often. If you have, you know, like a wooden, anybody would grab this and swing the same way you would with a sword. So pure sandbag, this is a classic shape because it gives you the wasted grip and then as much mass as possible at the top. And that's almost kind of counterintuitive, that, that, that motion as an actual strike. And if I come, like, this is very natural, right? Come down on the collarbone, whatever. But this is really odd. It doesn't work very well. Like, you can strike strongly like this. But here, you can't. So there's unusual angles that work really well, and then usual angles that don't work well. So, you know, with, with a weapon, with an impact weapon, you would almost never do kind of a rising flat strike. This was something people do all the time. 
here's the guy, he's getting your grill. You slip this out of your pocket and just ride straight up. Mm. And you've got, and that flat surface, right? Is a perfect connection to the chin, perfect uppercut. But that's a really strange weapons grip and hold. The Big John was more of kind of a weird experiment. Like if it's this big, it might as well just be rigid in my mind. So you can do, you know, all kinds of things. The selling point of these are that they're pocket clubs. This is weird. It's so big, but I can't really block with it, right? Here comes my opponent's strike and it hits me anyway. So the fact that you can't block with this is okay because it's so tiny. Why would you try to block with this? So I think that kind of thing gets a little bit crazy. Um, does, does the seam here, actually make it stronger? Like I'm curious if, if you were to block maybe with the narrow side, would that kind of give it more yeah. integrity? Like here, here's kind of probably one of the, one of if not the most popular flat saps with police of the 20th century, and it was called the Texan. It was called, it was one of the Buckheimers, mm -hmm. and it was called the Texan, of course, because it was big, right? So you can see this. This is pretty big, and it hits plenty hard. If you hit, like you're saying, with the seam, with a flat sap, unintended use, but devastating. You break a collarbone, kind of like a chop to the right, you know, mm -hmm. break your stun, you know, whatever you want. Um, so it's kind of devastating this way. It was not designed to be used that way. And this bypasses, if I do this, it bypasses all of the flexibility, right? There yeah. is no flexibility here. So that was kind of a nasty improvisation or trick uh, that you could do with these. This one's super weird. It's, look at the amount of work that went into this. It's just, you know, beautiful wood turning, a heck of a lot of work went into this, right? This could have been a kosh, uh, for people who don't know, is kind of a, you know, a general British term for a club. It's kind of like their sap, meaning their overall umbrella category for everything, for lots of what we're talking about. So they would have called this a kosh. It could have been called a banker's kosh, a cashier's kosh, cashier's kosh as in, or banker as in, I have it under the desk in case somebody tries to rob me and I pull it out and, and smack them. Uh, but this is just insane. And look, we still got the, this is from like, you know, the Victorian era. We still got the maker's name on there. So there's lead inside and that takes a lot of trouble to construct this so that that connection holds this whole thing together during combat obviously it was made to look nice too and it feels great but it's just really bizarre so it is a it's basically a mini flail but with such limited range i call these flop heads so in the native american tradition this is much more rare because it's a full flail which you would get more often way more often is something like this, a flop head, where the stone would wobble on the end of the stick. So Native Americans and English weapons makers in London, the same strategy, which is this way, it's very unlikely that my kosh is going to break on me in combat. So this lets the energy dissipate. The highest stress, the highest stress point doesn't go into the wood. It goes into this and it can just, you know, so you pop them and it doesn't matter if this thing is bouncing around. It's saving that stress on any wood right here. This is really light. Like, Alice, if you got to hold this without the load, I mean, this is like feather light. It's okay. an exotic hardwood that is now endangered, but they loved sourcing this kind of wood. Um, Ligonum vate, I probably mispronounced it. But this is one of the strongest woods in the world. But this feels like absolutely nothing. So if, if, we had to, if you or I had to fight with just this, you're basically holding a yawara or a kapo stick. I mean, you're, mm. it's it's only going to be for poking because this is just feather light. But you get that you get that metal in there, and of course you'll notice this one has, and again, one of the hardest, the densest densest woods in the world, and it's got a heck of a crack. So we'll never know how that crack was earned. You know, did somebody's skull end up producing that crack or not? We will we will never know. But yikes! And you see that peg there? Yeah. Got a peg there. Got a peg there. Like that's a lot of trouble to go through when you could just. You know, you just carved me up one of these, bam. You know, so I, I love the the oddity of how much work went into these. This one's beautiful. Looks like a rose. Looks like a leather, like a leather rose, right? And you got all the a rose is a good way to describe that. Yeah, <laughs> all the metal and they are those it. thorns coming out. Is no, the... it's like it, it's a it's like you see the spring right there. It's it's a it's springs that are stretched around the metal, which is coiled around. A few, they have all this metal coiled around, you wrapped around, and then a few times they took some sp like spring-like metal, really thin spring, and wrapped it around some of those bands. Just bizarre. And this thing does not weigh very much at all. Ooh, sorry, I mean like nothing. 
So you have to have that flexibility to make this have enough impact to do something. So this is kind of a blackjack. It's like a pre-blackjack in a way, right? So yeah, it's gorgeous. It's weird, you know? I remember when I put this one on the internet, people said, that's like more of a pain compliance thing. That this is not a combat weapon. And I, based on my research, I disagree. Like I would hold it like this. If you hit somebody in a knockout spot with a full swing on this, I think they're going to sleep. Like I have one that I didn't bring today. I wish I had, but it's super light. And as, as one of my first videos that I made, and as I say in that video, it was so light. I was really disappointed. I thought this thing's filled with cotton. It's not even sand. It's just cotton. And then like, you know, being an idiot, I smacked myself in the head with it, right? <laughs> and I did. And it's like, I saw stars. It did have a real load, a metal load. But I mean, like, like half an ounce, one ounce of metal. Something we should mention that is that a typical load is like eight ounces mm -hmm. in the head, something like that. And then they, they vary from there. So this one was like nothing. So the speed can really, the speed and the flexibility, back to this one, can really compensate for the lack of you know, the lack of weight, the lack of, the lack of mass. This one's super rare. And it was years before I learned, before I learned what this really is. I knew it was a blackjack, don't get me wrong. But when I bought it, I didn't realize how rare it was. There was somebody auctioning a bunch of jacks from like South Texas. They said their father was a cop and worked in prisons and confiscated all kinds of weapons. There was a police officer in San Antonio, a few hours south of where I am in Dallas, who made these very unique design. And the leather is not typical. It's like rawhide. It's this will cut. Like this is rough leather compared to any of these other. This feels like a pillow. So this is a Sergeant Rice blackjack from San Antonio, Texas. And I think it's gorgeous. I love everything about it. The little scorpion type, you know, tail. So this one's brutal. And again, I talked about how blackjacks would notoriously cut with this rough leather and these uneven surfaces. This will definitely cut. And that's something that was well understood. Uh, something I should have mentioned for an earlier question of yours is a braided blackjack. Anything braided, they understood, was more likely to cut than if it was if it was smooth. Um, I got a lot of flat saps. So they all kind of you know go along the same lines. Real typical uh, Smith and Wesson medium sized model, right? You might be able to make out the Smith and Wesson logo. So look at that. I, mean, I love this look too. That's crazy to me. This kind of teardrop look. I love when they have like, the, I love flat saps. Like I say in the book, they're one of the craziest weapons ever invented. They're really bizarre. This one's made by some regional maker, Gould and Goodrich, long time ago. And it's kind of like really sleek. It's like a nice wallet. You know what I mean? It's like a fancy, it's like a fancy wallet in a way. And it feels great. It's just smooth and nice leather. And I mean, that's, it's insane that this is an effective weapon. There are yeah. more effective weapons at this size, a knife, you know, a hammer from the hardware store. Speaking of bizarre, we've got this one. So it's got a belt holster. And this is some homespun rough construction, right? So clearly you're meant to wear this on your belt. And, you know, it's got these two tails. So I, I dubbed it a two tails, right? And this is your handle. So how crazy is that? That's your weapon's handle. So right? you just pull it straight out by the, by the straps. Straight out straight out of the belt and now you've got your load in here and look at the the degree of work that went into forming this and if i you know if you were here allison you kind of like manipulated this a little bit you'd realize there's not even just like one solid slug of metal there's like two maybe three so for reasons we'll never know they took a few components put them together went to all this trouble and then decided this was the way to manipulate this weapon so it's kind of like a slung shot because it's free swinging, right? And But that free, free swinging nature means it can generate a lot of speed and power. So you got that on your belt and you, yeah, you can yank it out, pull and strike. Uh, the quick draw was something that was big with these. Like if I put this in my back pocket, right? It's sticking out of my back pocket. You can't see that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I start distracting the person that's talking to me and, you know, like, please, like, you know, I don't want any trouble. Like you can... That came straight out of my pocket and into a strike. So the quick draw was a big deal with the flat saps because they would slip out of a pocket so easily. In the dark, this would look like your wallet almost. Yeah. You know, like, okay, here's my wallet. Bam, you know? And then that, <laughs> that power generation within a small amount of space comes into play, comes into play too. One of my theories is you could wrap a finger around it and now I'm not going to lose this. Again, the power generation within a limited workspace is really important because if I have this thing and I get tackled, I'm probably going to drop it, you know, maybe, right? I could, I could maybe try to 
get it in and you know find a pressure point to push against or something like that maybe some kind of you know stick grappling technique or whatever maybe but this little thing if i get on my back I mean, you can just whack away at the back of the person's head uh, and it's, it's going to do plenty of damage within that little space like that. That hurt my my forearm alone. So you could kind of wrap your fingers around it or you could just go ahead and grab the two like you wanted to. Just really, really strange. So that one's really cool. If you were defending yourself and then you wanted to quickly get rid of your weapon very quickly for right. I'm not encouraging anybody to hide any evidence, but unless in <laughs> In the old days, in the old days, right? Bam, bam, bam. Let's say you did your job and now you yank back and let go. This thing's going to go flying far away and land in some trash heap or grass or whatever. Um, The bandana with the padlock, that's one of the things they would do with those. After the final strike, release the padlock as you're swinging. The momentum sends that padlock flying far away and all you're left holding is a bandana. And like we talked about, the bar of soap that can obviously ditch the bar of soap and now i'm just holding a now i'm just holding a sock so then we're we're going through these you mentioned gonzalez here's a gonzalez these are that's like way thicker than i thought it was gonna be these are a southern california law enforcement tradition they never got big outside of those circles and it was one man and then at different times other people would help and etc etc very informal he invented them um, I've talked to like one of his main partners, you know, elderly now. I've talked to him, so that was neat. And he told me about how they would just go to the police range and scoop up leftover buckshot to put in these. And he said, you know, the machine would do the sewing. These are really thick. I mean, th- this thing you could work out with this, right? Like, you know, here's a policeman would typically carry this. This feels like a, you know, like a pen compared to a, a barbell. So it's just not even close. The Gonzalez saps are brutal, and they're real popular with them. For the people who do already know what these are, they love the Gonzalez saps. And a, a vintage one is really rare. I was into this. It was years after I wrote the book that I finally got my hands on a vintage one. I've got a modern recreation of the book. I need to do a second edition. But this here, this is bigger than most Gonzalez's that were actually carried. But like, it's still is that the, lar- the largest one, or this is the largest one, and like too large to carry but still indicative of how big Gonzalez saps are. So you can't hide the fact that you have this on you, right? right. It looks like you have a club in your pocket. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You, you cannot hide it. It's a monster. It's going to do a ton of damage. The one that I have a video on was is smaller than this one, and I did that rising strike that I like so much on my hand, and I, like, I was legitimately, so even after playing with all these for all these years, it legitimately surprised me how much it hurt. So this will come out backwards, I think, for you all, but... A lot of these started with police and then ended up with criminals because it just, you know, the popularity spreads. But this one here, like the, this, there's a steel shank in here, that flexible steel, like with this one, but we can't get this one to, we can't, we can't get this one, we can't get this one to flex. You know, you see that flex, like it doesn't matter. This is basically a solid, you know, rigid club. It has it has some flex in it. When when you strike, I guess it's going to do them a little bit of favor. It will flex a little bit away, but not much. And this has so much mass as just absolutely brutal. So yeah, so that's a rare one. I love these. I've got two vintage Gonzales. So I have to make a video on this one. I haven't made one yet. This is absolutely one of the rarest weapons you'll ever see, not just rarest impact weapons. It's a piece of bamboo, obviously. They loaded it up, and then they plugged both ends with leather, this thing, in my estimation, got carried for so long that the leather got worn away from sitting in a pocket. I've only ever seen one example ever online in this one. So that's two total ever. And I'm a guy who spends a lot of time looking up you know, strange, unusual weapons. In old literature, you'll sometimes read about a loaded bamboo. So this one, though, is it's a hard you know, load, not a soft one. There's nothing shaking around in there. Um, is it evenly loaded also? It is. So like, like considering the martial arts you do, like I, I, this one just feels amazing. I'm not aware of something quite this dimension, quite this weight in weapon circles. Cause normally like in a scream of stick, a knee tom bow, whatever is going to be bigger than this. Right. And then when it comes to shorter straight weapons, it's going to be Yawara's, all that kind of thing, which are, you know, much smaller impact flashlights. This is somewhere in the middle and it just feels amazing. It feels wonderful. I love it. And it, again, these, these tools are so bizarre. You do things with these you wouldn't do with any other weapon. 
if I strike in a very typical manner, well, at least I'm striking with leather instead of wood, right? So again, it's got that gentle factor, at least a little bit. If I hammer fist him on the temple, well, at least it's leather <laughs> instead of wood. If I hit them in a very typical way with this sweet spot, well, then they're getting the hard bamboo, right? You probably could hear that. I think there's a like a lead rod. And notice that tiny little peg right there. And see that leather sleeve fits right over. It's not supposed to come off. It's just over the years, this has come loose. So there's a construction. There's two pegs, I'm sorry, right there. Look how tiny that peg is. It's just insane to count on this in combat. Look at that. So there's a peg there. There's a peg there. Then they would put this leather sleeve around it, which has come off due to time, to help protect those pegs. And those pegs, therefore, must be what is keeping the load in place. But like as a weapons guy, I've got a black belt in you know Kabuto, right? Uh, you know Okinawan martial arts and weapons. Like it feels amazing. It's its balance point and its size, its dimensions. It's different, and it's also different that like you know if I do a feint here and come up and again you know like a hook hits a sided head. Like it's it's leather. It's like it's somewhat gentle. So you're getting that weight coming behind the somewhat softer right exterior. It's one of the really odd things about this weapons family. This one, even within this family, is super bizarre and super rare. Did you, in your research, find um, any instances of somebody going through the process of creating a weapon and testing it out? How, That's a really good question. That that's the part of research that was more like anthropology than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, like when we try to figure out, I've been doing a lot of research on like, you know, the original, original weapons, sticks and stones, that kind of thing. And a lot of this research was more like anthropology because people did not write down, you know, I'm going to try using a, you know, I'm going to try using a round coil, you know, because I think it's going to bounce away from the person after hitting them. <laughs> like we have to guess that that's what he meant. That's what he wanted. So people really did not stop to write these things down. This was usually a very rough and tumble crowd. These are not aristocratic weapons, right? Mm -hmm. So these are like working class people, street gangs, that kind of thing. You get a lot of crazy stories that you, you have no idea if they're true or not. You have, you have to make educated guesses. Sometimes you know a decent amount, like this guy here. We haven't talked about him yet. Like if I had just shown you this and said, what is this, Alice? What would you think it is? A tiny baseball bat. And what would you think it's made out of? Some piece of wood. Yes, yeah, and it's not. This is not made out of wood, and it's hollow. This is from this is from the 1800s. It's a policeman's billy, right? And like I said a little bit earlier, there was a big tradition of people trying to invent more gentle clubs. And by accident, those could appeal to criminals too, because like we said, I, I don't want to kill anybody. I just want to take someone's money. Um, so that is not wood. That is some kind of 19th century synthetic material, if you can believe it. You see like a, a mesh type, You're not, it's not going to come out, but there's a, almost like mosquito net right there. The surface is probably leather or something like that, because I had this thing called leatheroid, synthetic leather, believe, believe it or not, pre-20th century. Like I said, this is hollow. It's got, you can hear a little bit of a rattle. It's got some kind of solid load. It probably has a metal cable of some kind in here with the load. But then it's got like that mosquito net type material like I'm talking about. So layers and layers and layers of that. And then this, I don't think it's leather, like leatheroid exterior. So that's a lot of trouble to go through, right? A lot. And it doesn't look like it would, but it has some give. And it's got that beautiful, well-made handle. So this is to provide obviously a nice solid grip, right? The lanyard has been lost to time, but it would go through here obviously. And look what it does spins in place and it spins in place because even untrained people one of the first things they're going to do when you're smacking them with something like this they are going to instinctively grab it and you have a wrestling match on your hand absolutely yeah we haven't talked about one of the classic groups this is obviously man i lost it okay i've still got it right just like a battle axe with a lanyard but one of the more typical ways to do it was to do this Hmm. And now it's going to be really hard to, dis to disarm me with that. Not sure if this one's the right length, but it might be. You can do that. Try to try to intimidate them, look cool, whatever. Speaking <laughs> of things that should be in movies, right? Like, <laughs> and um, and like Maori warriors with their wahikas, whalebone and wood clubs, they would do that same spinning wraparound move. Funny enough, police learned a long time ago that happens, 
and with like a like a rigid lanyard. There we go. This one had a lanyard, right? So what can actually happen, believe it or not, especially if like it was like rawhide or something, you could get a wrist bind. As they're trying to wrench it out from you, it could actually do like a joint lock on your wrist. So this guy here, it's it folds up so it can all fit in my pocket nice, right? So when it's time to fight, you go here. This also spins in place. Just like the one that was originally attached here, so that when they grab it and try to wrench it, that free spinning means no pinch mm -hmm. is enacted on your wrist. And these, the thing with these is we have like the actual patent applications. So they did, write, going back to your question, they did write down why they were inventing this. Hey, I think this is better because one, since it's not solid wood, it can't break on me, or it's not, it's less likely to break on me, right? It's got some give to it, right? This is softer than wood. It surely is. And the impact is going to go through those layers and layers. So I have a somewhat, somewhat cushioned, you know, billy club. The weight on the inside is meant to give enough heft to do the job, right? But you've got a, a more humane billy club. The, the impact can, it can yield. It's got, it's got an elasticity inside in there. Plus a little bit of this elasticity, even though not very much at all. Uh, so these, we know exactly what they want to do. The street weapons are much more guesswork, but sometimes you can figure it out. Like, um, kind of like the lead bamboo, there was a type of billy club where you would take a, you know, one of the most common street weapons for a while was a gas pipe. You just rip a gas pipe out of the wall or some left, you know, old cities, kind of crumbly London, Chicago in 1920, whatever. You just grab a spare lead pipe, gas pipe. That's a very effective weapon in and of itself. You don't need to do anything. <laughs> that's, that's super effective. But just like with this, some people would plug the ends, fill it with something, makes it heavier. But unlike this one, which is solid, like we said, it's a solid load. Uh, sometimes they would fill it with loose metal shot or sand, something, those shifting internals, same as a sandbag. So I have a YouTube video on this where I recreated one. You, you take a baton that has those shifting internals. As you swing, all of the mass gets up towards the head. So now you're swinging a mace. And when it hits, all that extra mass has concentrated up at the top. So really interesting. And that really helps give it that stick when it comes to the... Uh, the impact. So, you know, when you take an antique like that, you can figure, okay, knowing what I know about sandbags, knowing for a fact that criminals like the sandbag because it didn't leave marks, et cetera, et cetera. I can say somebody bothered to fill a pipe with loose shot and plug it up and all that for the same reason, because they were looking to impart that concussive force without trying to break bone, you know, rip skin, et cetera. Um, oh yeah, you're you're also writing a book. Like, do you have a running list of other topics and weapons of interest that you you're going to be writing about? Yeah, I've done I've done several other books, non martial arts. I'm finally getting back to that. So I'm, I'm very happy with. I've already got the manuscript practically done. I'm revising it. It's called Deadly Intent: A History of Unusual Weapons. So this is what I did here was take one weapons family, like I mentioned more than once, and really deep dive on it. Right, like learn everything possible, capture that history, preserve it. So instead of taking one weapon subject and deep diving, I'm going to go across multiple weapons. So anything, I, I, I skip all over the globe, all over the centuries. Got my, I can't show it to you, but it's on the computer that's holding this up. Uh, history of unusual weapons. Uh, so I'm really happy with this. I'm glad to finally get back to writing about weapons. I always thought I would, and I need to. So at the moment, I have 76,830 words, 20 chapters, stuff from like modern street weapons to really ancient things indigenous fighting implements like the maori i mentioned them before some things that like traditional quote unquote traditional martial artists will recognize like the iku the boat or uh so kind of go all around most of them would be very unusual um some really wild stuff like i'm pretty sure you have not heard about how back in venice they would have these giant street brawls but i mean giant speaking of things that should be in movies giant street brawls and imagine i've been to venice it's gorgeous imagine in venice these battles culminating at the bridges and people on top of all those, you know, beautiful old palaces and whatnot, ripping the roof tiles off and throwing them down on their enemies while other people pried up the cobblestones from the street to hurl as weapons. Uh, These so are got, what musicals are made of. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that'd be great. Musical, yeah. So uh, 
So if anybody wants to follow my my YouTube channel, it's called Object History, and I'll definitely be announcing when I'm getting ready to put that book out. One of the book, one of the weapons I was writing on, I was going to make my final chapter, my big final chapter, really fun. Uh, and I fell in love with it so much that I'm going to do a whole separate book on it. And I've already got like 8,000 words. And that's the straight razor. Do you remember like the old fashioned? That's straight, a good one. That's a the good fashioned straight razor. Yeah. yeah. Just like with saps, almost nothing about them. Very little. There's one book, if you want to call it. So I've already put out feelers to all kinds of, you know, fellow weapons geeks. I want all the information I can get. And it's again, has that real old school bygone era kind of a thing. A lot of just boy, that one's nasty, as you can imagine. A lot of really nasty fights. So it was, especially in the American South in the old days, it was like, you and I have a problem. Let's go meet at the bridge in the middle of the night, and we each have our straight razor, and one of us will, one of us gets to walk back to town. Is absolutely insane. Uh, is but it, that one is I'm, there like a? I mean, is it harder to to do the to do this research when uh, there isn't like a law enforcement backing to these weapons? Yeah, yeah, the law enforcement really helps because court cases are like your best friend, right? <laughs> Court cases are great. I love court cases. You can search the old Bay. One of the one of my resources is the old Bailey Courthouse. A lot of people might know that in England, real famous in London. They have records that go back centuries. So you sit there and do keyword searches. And mm. just the other day, I was like, I want to find an Englishman beating another Englishman with a boat oar. There's got to be one in here somewhere. <laughs> and then speaking of that, something I'm just I'm just going to mention it because I'm proud of it. And it just all happened very recently. I'm now a court recognized weapons expert. I was contracted by the uh, Department of Justice for uh, one of the states. I probably shouldn't say too much and did a ton of research for them, et cetera, et cetera. So my writings had already been used in federal court and now I'm serving as an expert witness too. So I'm kind of happy about so that. That is so excellent. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. That was very recent. It was like a second job. I was working on that every night. It was it was a blinding amount of work to do after my day job every day, but I'm, yeah, I'm real excited about that. Wow. That's really cool. Thank you so much for your time. I really <laughs> enjoyed this conversation. Oh yeah. Was... Like I, like I, I don't need an excuse to go on and on about this stuff. So thank you. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if people wanted to find you is, is YouTube the, the best bet? That's object definitely history. the place. That's, that, that's my main place for sure. So object history, if you see some old Roman cestus, you know, knuckle dusters as the avatar. That's me. You'll obviously see it on there. It's not just weapons. I do anything that interests me. So I have folklore mythology. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, but I always have weapons content and will continue to do so and talk about my new book and all that kind of thing there. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I will, uh, I guess, I'll let you know when this is back online. Yeah, please do. All right. Yeah. Thanks for reaching out. All right. Cool. Yeah. Have a good evening.